Welcome to the Faith and More podcast. This is a transdenominational podcast. All are welcome and safe here, no matter what your faith is or isn't. Hello, my name is Reverend Angel Wise, and I'll be your host. I am an ordained licensed minister, director of the Oblates of Perpetual Light, intuitive healer, Kabbalist, and life coach. I firmly believe that the divine works through people every day to help us. These angels and saints are so very humble, many of us don't know they exist or existed. Each week we will explore the lives of these amazing beings. We will also explore topics that can help your faith, no matter what it is or isn't. The goal of this show is to encourage, educate, inspire, uplift, strengthen, and heal you and your faith. So be sure to follow and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Enjoy the show. And welcome to the show, everyone. How are you all doing? I so hope and pray you all are well and blessed. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you're new to the show, welcome. I don't know how you found us, but I'm so beyond happy that you did. It is my deepest hope and sincerest prayer that you find everything that you're looking for or searching for in a podcast, especially a faith-based podcast here and more. And if you're returning, infinite thanks Blessings and love for being a longtime loyal listener and supporter of the show. It is because of you that this show is here. For the first time in Faith and More history, we have Saints in the News. Or should I say, maybe, possibly, sometime soon sometime maybe in our lifetime maybe not a saint <laughs> those of you uh well let's just do it show of hands how many of you have heard of sister wilhelmina lancaster or lancaster l-a-n-c-a-s-t-e-r here's a hint the state of missouri in the united states any of you have you heard anything about her recently in the news, especially after, say, May 18th. I'm giving hints. <laughs> There's a couple, but yeah, the vast majority of us have not. And her story is quite fantastical. Yeah, I'm going to have to uh, play the disclaimer. Warning, the following may be considered fantastical. Okay, so with all that out of the way, let's get to the story, okay? The first story I'm going to share with you is from the Catholic News Agency, and this was written on May 24th. That's how fresh this story is, and the incident actually happened or began on May 18th. So it says, when the Benedictine Sisters of Mary, Queen of the Apostles, exhumed the body of their foundress, Sister Wilhelmina Lancaster, OSB, on May 18th, they found the unexpected. Four years after her death and burial in a simple wooden coffin, her body appeared remarkably well preserved. The news quickly spread on social media about the unusual state of the remains of the Contemplative Order's African-American foundress, drawing hundreds, now it's, it's well into the thousands, of pilgrims to the monastery in rural Missouri. Questions remain to be answered about whether an investigation will take place. That's been answered. There is an investigation ongoing to examine her remains scientifically. In the meantime, many people want to know more about this woman who, at the age, tender young age, the baby baby age of 70, 70, founded the order of sisters best known for their chart-topping Gregorian chant and classic Catholic hymn album. So just a little backstory. As you can see from the um, photo used for the album cover for this show, I could have went with pictures of her after she was exhumed, but I found that picture that's up there now that is so freaking adorable. She is just such a beautiful and amazing soul. And if you look at that picture with your heart, you feel every bit of her energy and love and holiness. And she's just, 
beyond amazing. And so many people are already calling her a saint. And we'll get into and discover why was she exhumed and under what circumstances and all of the details or as many details as we have as we go through her story. Um, in the show notes, I will be sure to include a list or excuse me, a link for this article as well as another article I'm going to be sharing with you as well as two uh, videos from the news. One is from EWTN and the other one's from a local uh, Missouri news team that actually went to the monastery and has video um, of Sister Wilhelmina laying in state and people coming up to her. And we'll get into all that as well. But I just want to let you all know now that, as always, there are links to everything I'm sharing in the show notes and description. So before we deep dive into all these what's, why's, and how's, let's learn a little bit about this amazing being who flew under the radar for, well, up until May 18th of this year, which just this past month. So we'll begin. This is the second of five children born to a Catholic parents in St. Louis on Palm Sunday, April 13th, 1924, Mary Elizabeth Lancaster, she took the name Wilhelmina when she made her vows, was raised in a deeply pious home. According to the current abbess, Mother Cecilia Snell, OSB, and as told in a biography published by her community, the future sister Wilhelmina had a mystical experience at her first communion at the age of nine, wherein Jesus invited her to be his. And yes, I will have a link to this bio book that they are talking about and referring to uh, in the show description as well. She saw something of him at her first communion, maybe not very clearly, but she saw he was so handsome, the abbess said. He said, will you be mine? And she said, he is so handsome, how can I say no? After this experience at the age of 13, her parish priest asked her if she ever considered becoming a sister at the age of 13. Though she had not, she was quickly moved by the idea and wrote to the Oblate Sisters of Providence and Baltimore seeking permission to join at the age of 13. But she was too young, so she had to wait a little bit longer. Oblates, huh? Does anybody, does that ring a bell to anybody? Does the Oblates sound familiar? Let me play something real quick, not meaning to sidetrack, but just to refresh your memories and minds on what Oblates significance is for this show and for this Faith and More ministry. And then we'll get right back to the story. In today's internet world, there are so many choices and so many things on the internet that uh, lure you into extending or working on or enhancing your faith. And most of them charge you for it. How about an absolutely free way and a free group that will love you unconditionally, no matter what your faith is or isn't, what your beliefs are or aren't. And again, did I mention free, absolutely free? Well, look no further. Check out the Oblates of Perpetual Light. I happen to be, just happen <laughs> to be the director of the Oblates of Perpetual Light. And I would love to have you check us out and become a member. Again, it's absolutely free of charge. Check us out at oblatespl.wixsite.com slash oblates-pl, or you can email me directly at oblates.pl at gmail.com. There'll be links in the show description to get to those web addresses. So you say, what are the Oblates of Perpetual Light? Well, it's the first of its kind. We are a very first group of Oblates to fully utilize the internet to organize and communicate. This allows everyone and anyone to join from all over the world. The Oblates of Perpetual Light are inclusive, meaning everyone is welcome, regardless of beliefs, faith, identification, gender, sexual preference, etc. We are independent, meaning that we are not affiliated with any church other than being connected to the faith and more ministries. And we are trans-denominational. We are not affiliated with any one religion. 
Although our structure is very Benedictine, our oblate director, hello, can easily assist you with adjusting to your faith no matter what it is or isn't. We greatly respect the beliefs and freedoms of all others. We all are children of the universe. Only four things are required to be an oblate of perpetual life. First is to study and contemplate some sacred text of your faith at least once a day. It can be anything, any size, even a sentence or a word. It's imperative that an oblate pray sometime during the day. That's the second one is prayer. Again, it's up to us to choose when, where, and for how long. Number three is oblates will gather together online, typically on Zoom at least once a month. And that's usually the last Sunday of every month, if not the second to last Sunday. And it's not required. These are things as far as the meeting goes. If you can attend, that's great because you get to not only talk to, but you get to see your fellow oblates. And the fourth requirement is love and respect all members, regardless of their faith. We are here as a group, not just individuals. Every faith, belief, view, etc., will be respected. Bullying, hate, attacks, etc., will not be tolerated. So you are absolutely and completely safe. If this sounds like something you would be interested in, please check out the website. Again, a link will be in the show description or email me directly at oblates.pl at gmail.com. <laughs> okay, I just want to make sure everybody was clear on what oblates are. And yes, you can become an oblate. Let Sister Wilhelmina inspire you to become an oblate with us. So anyway, back to the story. The excerpt of the letter reveals a stunning straightforwardness and enduring faithfulness given that she would die having lived 75 years under religious vows. She wrote, Dear Mother Superior, I am a girl, 13 years old, and I would like to become a nun. I plan to come to your convent as soon as possible. I will graduate from grade school next month. What I want to know is whether you have to bring anything to the convent and what it is you have to bring. I hope I am not troubling you any, but I have my heart set on becoming a nun. Of course, I am a Catholic. God bless you and those under your command. Respectfully, Mary Elizabeth Lancaster. Oh. Isn't she just freaking adorable? Now play that part again and look at the picture that's on the, the cover for this episode. Wow. She is just, what an amazing, blessed being. Growing up under segregation, Mary Elizabeth was once taunted with the nickname Chocolate Drops as she ran through a white neighborhood on her way home from school. And although she also was ridiculed as the lone Catholic among Baptist and Methodist peers, she refused to harbor resentment for her treatment. When the local Catholic high school became segregated under the Christian brothers and public school seemed like her only option, her parents went to great efforts to ensure that their daughter and her schoolmates would continue their Catholic education. According to Sister Wilhelmina, as recounted in her biography, her parents, who did not want me to go to the public school, got to work and founded St. Joseph's Catholic High School for Negroes, which lasted until Archbishop Ritter put an end to segregation in the diocese. She graduated as valedictorian or valedictorian. I'm sure she did. <laughs> of the school, her parents helped to found and then entered the Oblate Sisters of Providence, one of only two religious orders for black or Hispanic women. She would remain with these sisters for 50 years under vows. During her 50 years in religious life, Sister Wilhelmina witnessed the changes brought by Vatican II and sought to preserve the habit, even constructing one of her own when the sisters stopped producing them. If that doesn't make any sense to you all, um, when Vatican II happened in 1969-ish, um, it became an option for nuns to wear habits. And 
there are very few orders now that uh, in the United States, there's more so uh, um, abroad, um, but in the United States, sadly, um, a lot of nuns have t it's dropped the habit and become just wearing regular clothes. The only way to identify them is if they have their cross necklace or crucifix showing, because each order has a distinct um, crucifix or cross that they wear for their order. And the, one of the many ways I know this is from my wife and our sister of the show, Haven, uh, the place where she works, she's gotten to know the local, a lot of the local um, nuns who are sisters that come into her place of employment quite often. And um, as a matter of fact, she encountered one not so long ago that came in very salty, snippy, and was very quite rude and um, just admonishing everyone and treating them like garbage. And my wife was called because she's in management to assist uh, with this unruly um, patron. And my wife got up there and first thing she saw was the cross crucifix that identified her as a sister. Now, she had not at one at any given time identified herself as a nun or a sister. So when my wife was uh, very patiently and very kindly assisting her and trying to get her to calm down, my wife was referring to her, or since a sister Haven was referring to her as sister. I'm so sorry, sister. And when, you know, it was, you know, ex, you know, putting emphasis on that she knew who she was, that Sister Haven knew who this sister, that this sister was a sister, trying to bring her focus back to what she is, what she represents, the vows that she has taken, and to stop acting like a two-year-old. And so again, as we see, Sister Wilhelmina was one that said, you know what, this habit represents who we are. Uh, it not only reminds people of when you go out into public, who you are, but it also reminds you of who you are. You know, so you are visible when someone walks up wearing a nun's habit or a priest collar or a cassock or a cassock or, you know, any kind of vestments, you know who, what that person is and they should be acting accordingly and they should be treated accordingly. Um, it's a uniform. You know, I, Father Mike and I've had this discussion a long time ago. Um, when I started wearing the collar and I started wearing a cassock and vestments and things of that nature. And when I go out, I mean, yes, I am seen differently and I should be seen differently. And yes, it's, it's a blazing symbol of something that either people love, don't know about, or they hate. So you're going to get everything and anything thrown at you and you have to be ready. But again, it's a uniform and it reminds you of the commitments or vows or whatever you've taken and what you are representing. So if you go out and you don't, as a nun, you, as you can see, some of them easily fall into that being a normal person, you know, even though they're a nun or a sister, they, you know, and I know we all have bad days. We all can get grouchy and I'm not admonishing anybody for that. I do that myself. My sister Haven can tell you <laughs> all about it. But what I'm saying is, is when you are representing something, you, you should be representing that. You are not you, you are that representation. Um, so anyway, you know, they even stopped making the habits. The sisters stopped making the habits for their order. And what did Sister Wilhelmina do? She started making her own. The article continues. She spent so many years fighting for the habit, said Mother Cecilia, who said Sister Wilhelmina took seriously the idea that the habit signifies the wearer as a bride of Christ. According to her biography, she made a habit for herself, creating parts of the headdress out of a plastic bleach bottle, even as her sisters no longer wore theirs. As the Catholic Key reported, her 
homemade habit may have saved her life when she was working as a teacher in Baltimore and the stiff high neck collar known as the gimpe deflected the knife of a disgruntled student. Her biography tells of an occasion when a sister passing her in the hallway pointed at the traditional headdress and asked, are you going to wear that all the time? <laughs> I love her reply. Yes, Sister Wilhelmina responded and would later quip, I am Sister Wilhelmina. I've a hell of a will and I mean it. <laughs> oh, she's such a fireball. After years of trying to get her order to return to the habit, she happened to hear about the priestly fraternity of St. Peter starting a group of sisters, and she had rediscovered the Latin mass and fell in love with it. Mother Cecilia said, and one day she packed her bags. She's 70 years old and she went to found this community. Just a complete leap of faith. 1995, with the help of a member of the priestly fraternity of St. Peter, the community began. Over time, it would take on a more contemplative and distinctly Marian charism with a special emphasis on praying for priests. In her proposal for a new community, Lamina said she wanted to return to regular observance, something she petitioned for during the general chapter of the Oblate Sisters of Providence. The wearing of a uniform habit, the surrendering of all monies to a common bursar, the obeying of lawful authority in all departments, the guarding of enclosure and of times and places of silence, and the living together an authentic fraternal life, she wrote. In short, in her new community, she imagined a return to the ordinary discipline of religious life. The new community, which began in Scranton, Pennsylvania, followed St. Benedict and his rule and chanted the traditional divine office in Latin. In 2006, the community accepted an invitation from Bishop Robert F., or excuse me, Robert W. Finn to transfer to his diocese of Kansas City, St. Joseph in Missouri. In 2018, their abbey, Abbey of Our Lady of Ephesus, 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 excuse me, was consecrated with Mother Abbess Cecilia as the first abbess with Sister Wilhelmina under her authority. In 2019, seven sisters left the abbey to establish the order's first daughter house, the Monastery of St. Joseph in Ava, Missouri. Today, the sisters continue to lead lives of silence and contemplation following St. Benedict's rule. They partake in the extraordinary form of the Mass and use the 1962 monastic office with its traditional Gregorian chant in Latin. The community records an album in the St. John's Chapel, Benedictines of Mary, Queen of Apostles. Sister Wilhelmina is remembered for her love of Our Lady, even in the last years of her life, when she was suffering from fragile health. Regina Trout, a former postulant who cared for Sister Wilhelmina and is now married with children and a lecturer in biology at Purdue University, Fort Wayne, recalled seeing her visibly moved. Whenever you would talk to her about Our Lady, you could just see that spark. She loved Our Lady so much, and that came through so strongly, she said. And for those of you who aren't Catholic, what they mean by Our Lady is Mary, the, the mother of Jesus. Sister Wilhelmina's last conscious words, O Maria, sung two days before her death as part of a hymn, O Sanctis Isma, were a reflection of her deeply Marian piety, as well as the charism of the chart-topping music that glorifies God that the Benedictine Sisters of Mary are known for. She loved our Blessed Mother, Mother Cecilia said. That's what she would tell everybody coming here. Pray the rosary. Don't forget to pray the rosary. Love the Blessed Mother. She loves you. Her death was beautiful, the abbess told EWTN's ACI group. God arranged everything. We were singing, Jesus, my Lord, my God, my all. When we got to the rest of the song, had I but Mary's sinless heart with which to love thee with, oh, what joy, 
she opened her eyes and looked up. I mean, she had been comatose. We know she could hear us, but she was just not responsive at all for a couple of days. And then she just looked up with his face, a burst of love. For the abbess, it seemed like she was just already in heaven in those moments. Okay, so that was the first article. Now, you all know I like to do two or more articles because it gives us deeper and more information. And this article does what? This article from the Catholic Key by Sarah Kraft was written June 6th of 2019. So just after um, Sister Wilhelmina had passed, it says, she was the treasure of our community and bedrock of charity, said Mother Abba Cecilia Snell, OSB of the Benedictines of Mary, Queen of Apostles, located in Gower, Missouri. Sister, excuse me, Mary Wilhelmina of the Most Holy Rosary, OSB, died Wednesday, May 29th at 8.35 p.m. She was born Mary Elizabeth Lancaster on April 13th, 1924 on Palm Sunday. Sister Wilhelmina recently celebrated her 75th anniversary of vows and her 95th birthday. As a young girl living in St. Louis, Sister Wilhelmina wanted to become a nun. At age 13, she wrote a letter requesting to go to the convent as soon as possible because she wanted to become a nun. Later, Sister Wilhelmina was able to join the Oblate Sisters of Providence. She began her formation in 1941. As a sister, she took the name Wilhelmina. When she took her vows, Wilhelmina was chosen in honor of her pastor, Father William Marco S.J., who encouraged her to pursue her vocation. Sister Wilhelmina spent many of her years with the Oblate Sisters of Providence teaching in schools. Throughout her career, she taught in the Archdiocese of Baltimore, Washington, Charleston, St. Louis, Philadelphia, and Miami. While in Baltimore, her habits saved her life. The stiff gimpe, which is the high neck collar, deflected a knife that was thrown at her by a troubled student. From 1973 to 1985, she was archivist for the Oblate community. From 1985 to 1995, she assisted in the Mount Providence Center of Music and General Culture. In 1995, on the Feast of St. Bede, after 50 years in the Oblate Sisters of Providence, Sister Wilhelmina formally left her community to found the Benedictines of Mary, Queen of Apostles, with Father Arnold Devilers in the Diocese of Scranton in Pennsylvania. The order was totally consecrated to Our Lady in prayer and sacrifice for priests through the rule of St. Benedict. Today, the order devotes approximately five hours a day to chanting of the Mass and Divine Office. The sisters' remaining time is spent doing manual labor, such as sewing vestments for priests all over the world, gardening, cooking, cleaning, farm work, and other duties, mental prayer, and prayerful reading. The order is primarily contemplative. And that is absolutely, <laughs> truly amazing. That is so beautiful that they, they do that. It would seem I've done a very foolish thing, Sister Wilhelmina stated. After 50 years as an oblate sister of Providence, I am starting a religious life anew as the foundress of a new community affiliated with the priestly fraternity of St. Peter. To those who say that my leaving my old community to found a new one doesn't make sense, I reply that it is understandable only in the life of faith. When other people came, I welcomed them because I wanted to share what I had. The disciples were preserving, persevering in prayer with Mary, the mother of Jesus. This is a perfect description of the religious sisterhood that has formed. In 2004, she broke ties with her community and made private vows until 2014 when the Benedicting, Benedictines of Mary, Queen of Apostles, received formal recognition from the Vatican. In 2006, the New Order moved to the Diocese of Kansas City, St. Joseph. In 2010, the sisters moved to Gower, Missouri. Sister Wilhelmina was the Order's first prioress or superior. She has been such a support to the community, explained Sister Scholastica Radel, OSB Prioress. Even though we were taking care of her, it really seemed like she was sustaining us spiritually. 
Many years ago, our first chaplain asked Sister Wilhelmina, why did you become a religious? Her instantaneous reply was, because I was in love with our Lord. It could be easily said that even in her declining years, she never fell out of love with him, explaining Sister Scholastica. St. Bede the Venerable was Sister Wilhelmina's favorite Benedictine saint. 1,300 years ago, on the evening prior to the ascension, St. Bede the Venerable died peacefully as the evening offices were being completed. Although it was technically Wednesday due to the liturgical accounting, he is said to have died on the ascension since it was after sunset and first vespers of the ascension had been chanted. Following not only her beloved saint's footsteps in the love of the divine office and our blessed lady, our dear sister Wilhelmina followed him even in the manner of death, stated Sister Scholastica. On May 29th, following first Vespers, so the ascension had already begun. The entire community of 38 nuns gathered at 7 p.m. in Sister Wilhelmina's cell. After reading and singing, the community chanted Compline, which is the night prayer in her cell. As Mother Abbess was giving the traditional sprinkling of water from the oldest to the youngest nun, immediately after sprinkling Sister Wilhelmina, Sister Wilhelmina peacefully breathed her last breath. Sister Wilhelmina's funeral was held Friday, May 31st at the monastery. Burial was at the monastery graveyard. The nuns both dug and filled her grave by hand. May God have mercy on me, Sister Wilhelmina said before her death. I trust in the mercy of God. Oh, I am grateful to be here. I'm so grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be alive and to serve him in this community. I'm praying for Mother Cecilia. If there's anything I would want to pass on to the community, it would be this devotion to our Blessed Mother, true devotion to our Blessed Mother. And her biography is called God's Will, The Life and Works of Sister Mary Wilhelmina Lancaster. And of course, I will have a link to that in the uh, show description. So that those are the two articles to give you all just a little bit of a taste of who this beyond amazing and fantastical being is. Um, and I say is, is because regardless of physical, the energy, the essence, the soul, the spirit is still, is always there. And it definitely is with her. So getting back to um, the whole ifs, ands, what's, whys, and hows of all of this, they were building at the monastery a special um, crypt for Sister Wilhelmina, plus the reason why on May 18th, they went to exhume her body. Uh, they were going to relocate her body to the new crypt in the, I guess, chapel or church or um, something like that. It was going to be, you know, out just out of the instead of just being buried in a, in a plain cemetery plot. And there's pictures of this all over the Internet. And I believe in the news articles that I have links to. It shows that a little bit as well. Um, so she is buried in 2019 in a um just a wooden coffin. It does not look from the pictures I've seen um, of her layout with the other sisters. Of course, this is all over the internet. You can check this out. Just Google her and you'll, you'll find it. Um, it does not appear that the wood was treated, that it was just natural wood, which means um, it's going to um, decompose and break down at a you know regular rate because it's not preserved or anything in that in any way. Also, she was not placed in a vault, which is uh, a, a cement uh, crypt that goes into the uh, ground that the coffin or um, casket goes in and then has a lid, cement lid put on it, which usually has a seal to keep the elements and things out, which also slows down, you know, decomposition and the breaking down of the casket. So that wasn't the case here. It's specifically and explicitly said that these nuns dug her grave with their hands. And after placing her coffin, just a plain wooden coffin, into the ground, 
literally, they hand put the dirt back on or filled it in, filled in the, uh, the grave. So there's no barriers uh, between nature and Sister Wilhelmina other than that wooden coffin. So when they exhumed her on May 18th, just, you know, <laughs> just a couple weeks ago, um, the coffin was deteriorated, was gone. They said that the lining in the coffin was made from the same material or type of material that parts of her habit were made from. And that too had deteriorated. However, she had not, nor had her habit. As a matter of fact, they point out in one of the news uh, videos, it's in the show description, that the brand name on the socks she was wearing, that she was buried in, was still there when they exhumed her. So there was no bodily decomposition because that would have definitely taken off the brand name of the sock or whatever she was wearing. But this wasn't the case. So this is quite strange. The following is, is quite strange. Is they moved her body into the monasteries, chapel, church, whatever you want to call it, and set her up in the middle aisle. And they be immediately began allowing people to come in and not just come in, but allowing people to touch her. In the video, you'll see people walking up and actually touching her, her skin, her hands. The people bringing children and letting them touch. And I, I, I get it. I understand it from, from a, a, a Catholic perspective that this is a saint and by touching her, you receive blessings. And by touching rosaries and crucifixes and what have you to her, those items become blessed. I get that. But I don't quite understand. And there has not been an explanation given as to why you would just allow her to be out and open in the public in... I guess what I'm pointing at is you're exposing her body, whether it's incorrupt or not, to elements that until a formal investigation is done, should not be exposed to. Because, you know, exposing her to the elements could cause, maybe cause, severe decomposition or a quick decomposition. I so pray that doesn't happen because she's set to be investigated by the Vatican. They're pushing for that. Um, they have recently, uh, this, what was it uh, today? So it was on the 27th, May 27th, they officially stopped allowing people to come and view her and touch her. And they are placing her in her new crypt. Um, they have already had local morticians come and examine her body, and they're completely baffled. They have absolutely no explanation as to how and or why she is um, in such a preserved state. Um, from what I understand and have gathered on my own investigating, is she was not embalmed. So again, the decomposition process should have well taken place within four years. Um, but it hasn't. And you can view the pictures and video and see for yourself um, how remarkably intact uh, she is. She kind of looks mummified a little bit, but nonetheless, she, she looks, she's all intact. And there are no explanations for this. So again, as we've known uh, from those of you who are longtime listeners to the show know that people that we've showcased that are um, considered to be incorruptible, um, that is one of the first things that presents, you know, a, a red flag or a question mark or investigative note to the Vatican to investigate. So I'm sure there is going to be 
uh, something done because people that have been there and people that are viewing this online on the internet are already calling her and referring to her as a saint. And and they should. I mean, I, I'm, <laughs> you all listen to the show long enough know that I've called many people saints that the Vatican will never, ever consider to be uh, a saint. But it's not up to them as far as in my heart. It's up to, up to the people. It's up to Hashem. It's up to Adonai. It's up to God, the universe, the great mother, whatever you want to call that, which is beyond labels. But this case is just so interesting and it's so awesome that this is happening in our days, like right now that, like I said, at the beginning of the show, this is the very first time we've actually had a saint in breaking news. And um, I urge you all go to the show notes and description and check out those links, get her biography and read it. I plan on getting it. I mean, she is just, I mean, just from the information we received in just today's show is not enough for me. I, I want to know more about this amazing saint. And I will be sure to keep you all up to date on any updates that come down the pike when I find out, because I'm going to keep my ear to the ground for her. But as we all know, especially those longtime listeners, and I keep saying that quite a bit, uh, and I appreciate you longtime listeners, but as you longtime listeners know, the, the wheels of sainthood in the Catholic community uh, or in the Vatican move very, very slow. So um, her canonization and beatification, et cetera, and so on may not happen within our lifetime, but man, is she ever, you know, just <laughs> um, beyond amazing. I, I'm actually speechless. It's just, this is not something we expect in today's scientific day and age, right? But here it is. Here it is.
I so hope and pray that you've enjoyed the show and that you found everything that you're searching for here and more with us. Please feel free to stop by anytime, all the time. You are family. If this show has helped you, please, please, please share it with as many people as possible. Also, subscribe, rate, and review the show on whatever format you listen to. That helps move the show up in those formats so when someone does a general search, they're more likely to find the show. And if the show has really helped you and you have the means, please consider making an offering. Offerings are a great way to help sustain and improve the show as well as the Faith and More ministry. Offerings can be made through the Cash App. The show's cash tag is dollar sign faith and more, or you can find us at cash.app forward slash dollar sign faith and more. And don't forget about our YouTube channel. It's a fun place, folks. You can watch videos of weekly Ask Angel questions where people write me and ask me questions and I respond uh, on YouTube. You can also watch me do bi-weekly sermons and homilies. Also, audio of our shows are uploaded to YouTube where you can listen and much, much more. Just go to youtube.com forward slash at faith and more podcast. Next is prayers. I love to pray and our faith and more family love to pray. So let us pray for you. There are two ways to do this. The first is to email me directly at faithandmorepodcast at gmail.com. The second way is through our website. There is a form at the bottom of the website and the website address is faithandmorepodcast.wixsite.com forward slash my dash site. And there are always links to all of these things in the show notes for and description for each show. So until